Hello, everybody, and welcome in to another episode of the Couch GM's podcast. It is Wednesday, July 20th, 2022, and I'm your host, George Kurt, joined by the one and only Cody Roadcap. Cody, you're uh, you're without the glasses this week, so now we're going to officially be going a glasses-free podcast. Is that the thought? For sure. I mean, if you didn't check it out, George put up a clip of our show last week on uh, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube shorts, uh, just like a s- snippet of the podcast. And I got some feedback that I look like a dork, I believe was one of the words. You look like an idiot uh, with your glasses. So the glasses aren't coming back because people <laughs> didn't like them. Only George can pull them off. Apparently, but I mean, for you who don't know, I've been wearing them since I was in elementary school. And our old logo over here, I guess we're going to need a little bit of a rebrand if I stick with this. So we're going to see what happens. The logo but... is here to stay. Okay, so I'm going to have glasses forever, which is fine. I look sophisticated, I think, in my sadness on the logo. But what's we're going to cover here today on the show, we are going to hit some NFL news and notes, and we are going to hit kicker and defense rankings, as well as talk a little bit of strategy on how you should be handling those positions in your fantasy drafts. Make sure you find us on thecouchgms.com and our social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at the Couch GMs. Hey, I got it right this time. Well, Cody... Let's jump right into NFL news. Leading off NFL news, we're talking running backs this week. First off, there was a little bit of a Twitter spat between Ian Rappaport, who's the lead NFL.com reporter, and J.K. Dobbins. And Ian Rappaport reported that there's no sure thing that J.K. Dobbins is ready for week one of the season after his severe knee injury last preseason. J.K. Dobbins proceeded to come back out and say, I am right on track with my rehab. There's not there's not been any setbacks. I don't see any reason why I couldn't be ready for week one. So I still think it's looking positive for him. But there is definitely a point to what Ian Rappaport said about he there is still a chance he's not ready for week one. He's a young running back. There's no reason for the Ravens to rush him. So, Cody, what are your thoughts? And is there any fantasy impact? I think there is a little bit of fantasy impact, uh, depending on how you've been viewing the situation. Um, if you longtime listener or just found us this off season, you know, super early, we probably were one of the first fantasy podcasts to do, uh, an upcoming mock draft. And that was during the pro bowl week. And we dropped JK Dobbins because there was a little bit of speculation that he wasn't going to be ready. Uh, they were, you know, it was a very significant a- ACL tour. It was his meniscus as well. There was lateral damage. Like it wasn't, I don't want to say your everyday ACL tear because that makes it. Sound it was not bad. isolated for sure. But it, it was wasn't, multiple. It wasn't as, many. you know, of an easy fix as they've made ACLs this day. It's, uh, so I think there's always been some hesitancy. And I think you made a great point. Like, okay, are we talking ready for week one? Because, you know, week one is. Uh, not a real dot t- deadline. Like, okay, if he doesn't get back to week three, you know, how is that going to pan out? I think the biggest thing we'll have to p- pay attention in terms of fantasy is when does he start practicing? You know, training camps open up here, depending on your team. Some as early as the end of this week, starting next week, uh, rookies are starting to report already for some teams. He's probably going to start on PUP and you're going to pay attention. Is he getting ready to practice? Does he get any practice on time like if he starts the season on pup he's automatically out for six weeks that's you know in a way that's why we always encourage you to push your fantasy draft so far to the end of the preseason try to get those final roster cuts and whatnot and jk dobbins is a prime example of that when he comes off pup is going to be a big determining factor if he starts practicing even if he misses he's not ready for week one he you know you still expect him back ready to go they'll probably ease him into it but by week four you expect him to be back to his normal workload so not too much of a fantasy, you know, altercation based on this news, but that was also going in with the mindset that he might not be ready week one. Yes, but I just want to add on to what you were saying. So, yeah, there's the chance he starts a season on PUP, which means he misses six weeks to start the season. There's always a chance he gets activated from PUP and either just stays on the active roster, but is not activated every week. So there's a chance he can come back at any point in the first six weeks. There's also a chance he gets activated from PUP, makes the 53-man roster, and then goes on injured reserve, which means he's out for four. So it's going to be a lot of roster shuffling on the side of the Ravens, and we have to watch them as you go. And also to your point of just kind of schedule your fantasy drafts as late as possible. Good example is we just scheduled our League of Record draft for 
the 28th of August, which is right after the final week, the final set of preseason games. I think anywhere from that to the next week, which is a bye week before the season, is your sweet spot to try to get your drafts in because you're going to get rid of most of the camp injuries, most of the preseason injuries, well, all of the preseason game injuries. And then you'll have a good idea on how rosters are going to shake with depth charts as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you're talking scheduling, I, I actually like the following week, that bye week now that we have it, mm -hmm. because you get the final cut down rosters. Um, it is important to, you know, if you're new to the NFL and how it works, any player that goes on injured reserve during training camp before the final 53 cut down, he is out for the season. Any player that is carried on the final 53 and then placed on injured reserve after has the four can come back after four weeks. PUP, that means you don't ever pre you don't start practicing because you're injured. And once you come off of that, you're good. If you're on that all through training camp and at the start of the season, you're designated PUP, that's six weeks. So it is a little convoluted with the injuries. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to reach out to the couch DMs. You can find us anywhere on social, like George said at the top of the show. But George, we do have some other running back news. If it is news, I'm interested to hear your debate on this. <laughs> But Leonard Fournette, uh, he weighed in at 260 pounds during minicamp, and it came out this past week, which is kind of crazy that it took a month since minicamp happened for this news to come out. Uh, but the coaches aren't happy with how he showed up, what he, he looked like, where he was at physically. Any concerns that he won't be ready for the season? I know as a Packers fan, a lot of people have either been coming out, like calling him the next Eddie Lacy, Packers fans <laughs> saying, leave Eddie Lacy alone. But what are your thoughts on this whole news? Is it worth worrying about? In the grand scheme, it's probably not going to be an issue. And when you look at it, like, I feel like there's only ever been one running back that we've seen a weight issue happen. And it was actually something to be alarmed about. And it's Eddie Lacy, which is why this, you know, parallel has been drawn between the two right now. But training camp hasn't started. That's when you're going to get two a days. That's when you get most of this train weight training in and everything else. I'm going to be shocked if he stays at that weight. He could have come into camp out of shape. We see a couple of players that have come into camp out of shape. I think Traylon Burks for the Tennessee Titans, the rookie is one we were talking about. Like he kept coming off the field winded. There's still a long way till the season. So, I mean, I'm not going to say too much because I'm not moving in my rankings. I was also the person who was the lowest of the three of us on Leonard Fournette. So maybe you guys would talk about dropping a couple of spots in your running back rankings. I'm not sure. I don't think it's a big deal, but it's definitely I mean, I something have... just to keep in the back of your head that if nothing does change and we hear more reports of him still being overweight George and not in shape as we get closer. You're back. Okay. I'm not sure exactly what you heard, but I would say if you guys might be the ones that would drop in your rankings, I would not. But if, if you start hearing these reports closer to the season, he's still overweight. He's still out of shape. Then maybe really be concerned for now. Just keep it tucked in the back of your head and watch it. Definitely. And I, I think you made two great points. Uh, one, unfortunately we don't do two a days anymore. That's been banned out of the CBA. So we'll have to do a little Fair. bit of okay outside of, uh, you know, training on his own Two, it was many camps uh, that it was being reported that he, scheduled in it and we've already had a month whether he started training on himself i've seen a lot of players posting their training videos they're getting amped up I haven't seen any from him but that doesn't mean he's not working a lot of players say you know train and silence you know make a difference you don't have to post on social media to prove that you're a good player um once training camp starts we still have like 30 days until the nfl season i know it gets us one step closer we all get super excited but we still have three weeks of preseason, but there, I think there's two weeks before the first preseason game. And then you had the week after. So we have, you know, four to five weeks for him to get in shape. And I know it was, you know, some people are saying, well, he played at 225 last year. I'd imagine he was probably a little bit bulkier. You know, you can't go based on all the, the depth chart rankings and weights. We've seen that all the time. They, Sometimes those numbers just get inputted and that's not the actual playing weight you got to ask the players from the so I wouldn't be surprised if he was closer, you know, to 235, 240. That seems more like how he's been his whole whole career. So I think he'll be able to get back down there. The running back is a demanding position. Uh I'm not too worried about it. And honestly, I mean, Fournette, because Ronald Jones isn't there, makes him exciting. But at the if you think about last year. I know we're pretty high on him because there's no competition there besides the rookie Rashad White and Keyshawn Vaughn and Giovanni 
Giovanni Bernard, who, you know, hasn't made a name for himself in a few years. But, you know, we had his, our doubts with him last year. And I feel like he went in our league of record. He went in the very last round. Obviously, he's not going to happen again this year because of what he showed out, uh, especially, you know, playoff lending and all that. So I think we've seen we have past experience of, oh, we had some doubts about him coming into the season and then he proves us wrong. So maybe I'm too confident in past results, uh, but I'm, I'm not too worried about Leonard Fournette long term. So Cody's too confident. I'm probably not confident enough. We're going to fall somewhere in the middle and say that's probably a sweet spot for Leonard Fournette. But you can keep an eye on our rankings on the couchgems.com. We'll adjust accordingly as we see things change closer to the season. Moving on, we have more new helmets to talk about because we love talking uniforms, new looks. The Bengals announced a pretty sweet looking white helmet alternative. It's going to go with their white jerseys. That's uh, something I'm very excited about. And I just saw, I think it was on Tuesday, that the Panthers announced a black alternative that is black with just a blue single colored Panther on the side. I think both of them look super slick. I like how a lot of teams are going, I don't want to say more basic, but I guess the basic look is more modern with a lot of these helmet alternatives. Um, And I think it's going to make some really sick Jersey combinations that are going to be even more completed and polished than they were in the previous. How many years? Yeah. The Panthers, that matte black with that powder blue, like Panther outline is super clean, but the Bengals of all the, you know, new jerseys and stuff like that, they're going to be the winners of the off season. The white Mm -hmm. helmets, ever since the color rush jerseys were announced, what was, I feel like five years ago now at this point, the fans wanted a white helmet to go with the the Bengals white jerseys. They're one of the few teams that still wear their white jerseys from the color rush days a lot. A lot of teams have fanned out the white uh, color rush or their color rush jerseys. The Bengals made that a part of their rotation. And this year, adding the white helmet, not only is it a great move for the team, but like it is a team that knows the pulse of their fans. And, you know, that's us couch GMs all over the place. People that, that are supporting <laughs> yep. the teams, you know, if we ran the team, we would do this. And the Bengals fans said, if we ran the team, we would have white helmets and the Bengals actually listened. So I'm giving this as a dub for the couch GMs worldwide for making their voices heard, especially those in Cincinnati and Bengals fans around the world for saying, hey, we want this. We want to see this and leading this, you know, change that we're going to see. And I think it's going to be one of the cleanest looking uniforms on Sundays. 100%. And I think they're one of the few teams that can pull off a good white on white uniform. Like you said, so many teams are pulling away from not just a color rush, but just solid white jerseys in general. Like I know the Eagles used to were one of the few teams that wore a whole white jersey and they've con they've gone now to wearing green pants or black pants with their white tops. So the Bengals have something good going on. I'm glad that they're able to finish that up now. Um, and I'm really excited to see if any more helmet combinations come out in the next few weeks leading up to the season. But I think before we wrap up our new segment, we're going to talk a little wide receiver in the form of Madden rankings. So Madden's rankings are slowly starting to come out. We've seen a couple of 99 club members come out and we have a top 10 in rankings for wide receivers. I'll just read down the name straight here and then Cody can kind of talk a little bit more. Number one, the only 99 wide receiver is Devontae Adams. Then we had Cooper Cup, Tyreek Hill, DeAndre Hopkins, Stephon Diggs rounding up top five. And then it was Justin Jefferson, Mike Evans, Keenan Allen, Terry McLaurin, and Amari Cooper at number 10. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's pretty good. I, I feel like they got it right. The top wide receiver, I'm still going to argue, is Devontae Adams. I knew, And Cooper Cup <laughs> is right there at 98 overall. Uh, shout out to Devonte for the three time 99 club member um, Cooper cup right there. Tyree kill. I we're putting in fantasy. We're concerned about him because of the new system, the new quarterback, what that means. So that doesn't take away. He's a good, not a great, fantastic wide receiver. And I think that's also, you know, a good caveat. You know, when we talk rankings, especially when we get in later and we're doing kickers and defenses, they're super subjective. We're not saying we think this player is the best player in the nfl for example wide receivers i had justin jefferson as my top wide receiver matt only has him at 93 that's probably consistent about where he is in the league he's an ascending star but i had him number one because i think he has the potential to put out the best fantasy season but if you take it as best overall player what they bring to the table i think they they got it right in this one deandre hopkins is a name the fantasy community is going to be like how is he that high but the same thing we're having him low because of the suspension not because of the player 
that is available there. But the biggest surprise to me was nine and ten. Terry McLaurin, hmm. Amari Cooper, and Debo Samuel didn't crack the top ten. Debo Samuel is the one person that I was going to be like, how is he not in the top ten? Because I mean, in Madden, yeah, you're like you said, it's different than looking at fantasy. So like. That's why you'd see a DeAndre Hopkins still up there when DeAndre Hopkins is not in as favorable system as he was back when he was in Houston. And he really had an injury riddled year last year. So we're a little low on him in fantasy, but you know, he's a super talented wide receiver and he shouldn't be dropped yet until you see maybe two of those seasons like last year. Then you start worrying. But Debo Samuel not only was great in fantasy last year, but the man was all over the place. He could do everything. He did everything well. I don't a hundred percent understand how he's not. I'd put him maybe number eight right above Keenan Allen or number nine right below him. Like that's about where I would think he belongs. And I'm, I was shocked to see he didn't make the list for me. uh, Definitely for me too, was shocked. He didn't make it. And you know, we're just talking about the top 10, but you can go on EA's website and you can see all the wide receiver rankings. They released them all. And just so you know, Mark Cooper's at 90 overall. So a number 11 would be Michael Thomas 90 overall, which is, I think, you know, that's a lot of, you know, banking on what happened in the past tyler lockett is 90 overall which is actually higher than dk metcalf on his own team which is 89 overall tied with chris godwin and then we get to debo samuel so that part of the the line is very interesting you know how they have it ranking i don't know if this is some of like i always wonder with madden rankings is you know does there a little bit of hey we got to get this team to an 85 overall offense so how are we going to micro adjust these players like, do they look at it as a whole or are they really evaluating each player individually? Yeah, and I, this isn't the only time that we've questioned Madden rankings for whatever reason. And then we started seeing like the Madden ratings adjusters coming out like onto the sidelines. We started seeing that and I don't know if it's gotten any better or worse, but honestly, it's tough to rate wide receivers based on all these traits and then make them make everyone happy, I guess is what you would say. So they're doing the best they can. It's not a completely unreal, like, you know, ranking or whatever, but it's definitely worth a debate in a couple of cases. And I think that nine through 13 or whatever you just said, there is the one spot where I'm kind of shaking my head, but the rest of it, they, they pretty much hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And I just have a couple more, um, you know, interesting ones. Uh, one, if you're a Falcons fan out there, don't worry. Calvin Ridley is in the game. He's 86 overall. To the big trade of draft night, A.J. Brown to the Eagles, he's 87 overall. And I feel like the forgotten man in Tennessee, Robert Woods, is 86 overall. So it seems like they are wow. a lot, they're pretty high on that. And those two are pretty comparable. And then another big surprise to me is C.D. Lamb all the way down at 85 overall. And I know in the fantasy community, we're expecting some big things. So I would not be surprised if he's a high riser. And it is cool nowadays with the online gaming platform that you know they can update on a weekly basis or a quarterly basis and get these players more adjusted as they start to play. And it's not like back in the old days when you bought the game, that was their rankings. And no matter how well they played during the season, you were stuck, especially with those rookie quarterbacks at 70 overall, they didn't have the progression skills like they do now. Um, And this isn't official by any means, but I I do think in the, if you like us talking about Madden, I do think, you know, maybe the season we're going to try to stream some Madden games, maybe, you know, couch gm versus couch gm maybe a madden monday or a madden game of the week or something like that so madden's not going anywhere because again us as couch gms we all get our starts being couch gms on madden madden is not a sponsor by the way i would love if they were uh as much as i criticize their game uh but i buy it every year and i feel like that's a lot of people out there uh so more madden is definitely around for the couch gms but george you got anything else or should we head into our rankings I think it's time to head into our rankings. So why don't we talk some kickers and defenses? All right. And if you want a little preview of what we've got going on, you can head over to the couch Check out our consensus rankings. Uh, we're just going to talk with Cody and my rankings today and kickers and defenses, but don't take these super crazy either. Uh, I'm just going to start off with the whole fantasy advice of these guys should be going in the last two rounds of your draft um, at, at the earliest. Maybe if you really like a defense or something like that, take them third to last round. But I would still even advise against that. Like these, you have a better chance of finding 
a, a good defense that's going to carry you most of the season on the waiver wire, a defense is going to break out that we weren't expecting. Then you are trying to take a stab at a defense that we think is going to be good in a draft. Um, and even yet, they're not going to win you a lot of weeks. There's been maybe three examples of defenses since I've started playing fantasy that have won you weeks consistently. And then last year, you had Evan McPherson in the second half that beat everybody and got Cody a championship. Like, it, there's very few cases of these these positions making a difference in fantasy. We're going to give you our best guess on who you should be targeting to hopefully give you a little bit of an edge. But that little bit of an edge is not going to most likely win you a league. It's just going to maybe give you a little push to an extra win. Yeah, and I'm just going to, you know, follow up with what George said uh, the same times. That's why I'm a big proponent of, you know, and have the conversation with your league, like get them involved, like to remove kickers. I understand people are like they're, you know, they're players too. And George is shaking his head, but literally he just said kickers are so high variant that there's mm -hmm. no rhyme or reason. I mean, granted, I, and I won a championship and you can, Evan McPherson, I, it was the, one of the closest fantasy games in our league history. And Evan McPherson got a field goal after the Bengals got stopped on first and goal from the one essentially five times. And then they yep. finally just kicked a field goal. If they didn't get that, I lose the game. And that's what we're, that's why I'm saying that, you know, kickers are so, you know, hard to evaluate. It's not who's the best kicker. It's you got to find a team when you're looking at kickers, you try to find a team that their offense is good, but they have inconsistency issues. So, you know, they're going to move the ball and they were going to, but they're not always going to get it into the end zone. The high powered offenses that are always going to get it into the end zone sometimes aren't the best kickers, despite who we have as the top guy on our list is probably one of the highest scoring <laughs> yep. offenses. Uh, but it's also who has the strongest leg. It, there's just a lot of variance with that. And defenses are the same mm -hmm. thing. I mean, you can't get rid of every position. I know we joked about it in you know, our one league. They were trying to get rid of defenses too. And we're like, why don't we just have a kicker or a quarterback in five flex spots and call it a day? Cause oh, they were trying to get rid of tight ends. And we're like, cause yes, they're exactly that. Yeah. It's like, so there are part of fantasy. It makes the games more interesting. I mean, sometimes you get that 30 point defensive game and it like gets you back into a game that you never should have been in. So there is, I see the, the some of the sides of it. And then there's also the sides I don't like about it, which is why I'm, anti-kicker but George we got to do kicker rankings even though they're not my favorite position in fantasy football I hinted at it Tyler Bass of the Buffalo Bills is technically our number one kicker on our rankings now George and I both have him as number two but because we <laughs> are in who George has won and who I have won so much he gets to be up at number one on our consensus rankings at the moment these things get updated regularly Tyler will be inputting his so even by the time you listen to this, some of the uh, rankings might have changed a little bit, but Tyler Bass, why should he be the top kicker? Uh, the Bills are scoring a lot of points, and maybe that's not a good thing in one case because extra points are one point, field goals are three, but I feel like there's a lot of cases where the Bills are going to be in scoring position most drives that they have the ball. So yeah, they're going to score a lot of touchdowns, but they're also going to save a lot of field goal attempts as well. Um, and Tyler Bass last year was one of the most accurate kickers in the league. And he has a big leg. He can hit those 50 plus yard field goals. What's your bonus points? So I think all that together is just he's going to have an opportunity to score at least one point every single time the Bills touch the ball, which is just a big boost right there. Yeah. And I think this is a great, you know, we're talking about kicker number one, Tyler Bass, and he had a pretty good season last year, but he finished as kicker 10. So like, yep, that's the that's the <laughs> pretty high variancy, high inconsistency that we're talking about with kickers that always makes it such a, you know, who are you going to start? This is why I'll also say, like, if you're taking a guy like DeAndre Hopkins, you can sit, stash in your IR. Don't even take a kicker. If you have a super early draft, get an extra bench spot until you actually need a kicker. You know, I've gone in. There's two Monday night games. Like, I've gone into Monday night knowing that all four kickers are available on free agency. I'm not saying that strategy has never backfired and the other person picks up four kickers so that I can't win the game if it's a close matchup. But I just put four really good players on waiver wire. Right? So, Definitely, uh, you know, a little bit of give and take there. But, George, before we move on, what are some of your favorite kicker scoring roles? Because that's also all over the place. What are your thoughts on distances? You know, should you get penalized more if you miss an extra point compared to a field goal? What are some of your favorite kicker roles if your league is deciding to play with a kicker? Great question, Cody. And I'm actually going to refer here to our League of Record settings because I think 
if you know it is kickers i get it i'm going to level with you like not the greatest position even though i still think they do have a place in fantasy i think the settings that we put together do kickers better than like standard settings on pretty much any of the sites so i'll give you a quick rundown of how we go um for point afters you get one point for it and if they miss a point after you lose two points I know that doesn't seem like it's level, but I mean, the amount of point afters that are missed, you kind of deserve to lose two points if they miss one of them. And then for field goals of zero to four, 39 yards, you get three points. Your average field goal, you know, you get three points in the NFL for 40 to 49 yards. We boost it to four points. And then for 50 plus, we boost it to five because we know those field goals are hard to make. So you should get a little bit of a boost in fantasy for having a kicker that can make those field goals. And then we kind of do a dynamic scoring for loss points as well so if you miss a field goal inside 19 yards it's loss of three from 20 to 29 and 30 to 39 actually it's loss of two 40 to 49 yards is a loss of one and you don't lose points for missing 50 plus yard field goals mostly because most of the time they're going to be hard to make or it doesn't penalize you for a team going for like a 63 yard field goal to win a game or end a half or something like that yeah i think those are some great changes that we've adapted um, I'd still like to see kickers not be a part of <laughs> fantasy football, but at least, you know, there are some changes adding, you know, the losing points for missed field goals. It also, that also helps add a level of, you know, if it, you're not losing points, you're just taking everyone that has a huge leg because you want those long field yes. goals, but it adds, you know, sometimes the kickers, for example, the guy who scored, you know, the most fantasy points last year in fantasy football was Nick Folk of the New England Patriots. Not the biggest leg, but super accurate. He didn't really miss much. And that's a part of the reason why he finished as a top guy. And he can honestly be back up there. We have him a little bit lower. You have to wait and see. But let's get back into those kicker rankings. At number two, Justin Tucker. The leg, prop, I can say the greatest kicker of our generation, at least. Um some people might argue like Ryan Dempsey. Some people might argue Adam Vinatieri. We were at the tail end of Vinatieri, so that's why I'm going to give it to Justin Tucker for our generation. Uh, but number two in fantasy, I feel like he's always the kicker that gets drafted in like round 13, and, peop and people that subscribe to like not taking a kicker or drafting one with their last pick always are shaking their head. Yep. But it's his consistency plus the leg. We saw him break the record last year in Detroit. He can give you those five-point field goal options. Justin Tick. Tucker, solid guy, always at the top for fantasy. And if you are going to kick, get a kicker, he's always a guy that you know you're most likely going to target. Yeah. It, oh no. Exactly. Like I have him at number oh, one in no. my rankings because he doesn't miss. I'm still here. Oh, you're back. You're good. <laughs> we might have just had some talking over each other, but you're good. Yeah. Um, I have him at number one in my rankings because he just doesn't miss like the man's over 90% in field goal percentage and maybe at the most misses one extra point every single year. So playing in a league that we have the negatives for kickers, I always have him at the top because number one, the Ravens offense is good, but they do set up a lot of field goal attempts, which is one thing. And then two, he doesn't miss those field goal attempts. So yeah, he does have some down games because Baltimore's offense is a little up and down. And sometimes they just score all touchdowns and whatever. But the fact that he's not getting you negatives is that he's not hurting you and not losing you games. And that's what I'm looking for basically in the kicker position all the time. I'm right there with you, George. And number three on our list, number one in my rankings, but more importantly, number one in my heart of all kickers is Evan Money McPherson. He made a name for himself, the rookie kicker for Cincinnati. He made a name for himself in a good way, made himself in a bad way. When he didn't go inside for halftime, he said, watched it from the sidelines. Evan McPherson, I think why I'm still high on him is because, you know, we're still expecting, you know, a bigger jump. You know, they finally got the bang with some offensive line. We're expecting them to be this offensive powerhouse. And they have the potential, but it's still a very young team. Joe Burrow is going into year three. T. Higgins in year three. Jamar Chase into year two a lot of new pieces like this could be a team that puts up a lot of points and we're expecting them to, but could also have those inconsistencies. And Evan McPherson has a strong leg. That's why I am high on him. 
is he the best option? Like, if I would probably actually take Justin Tucker over Evan McPherson despite putting him number one. <laughs> number one was a little bit for George, too, because I know he hates it because I literally told him I'm going Evan McPherson the rest of the season, stuck to it, won a championship. But I think he's still a valuable kicker in fantasy, and George isn't too far off with, with him at number four. No, I mean, I feel like my top five to six are kind of like, oh, you could take any of these guys in – that you know in your kicker spot and you'll pretty much be fine because like you said they're high variance but all these guys are super accurate they have the big leg they're everything you're looking for really um and i can even move us into number four on our list he's number three on mine four on cody it's matt gay of the la rams um now maybe you'll say oh the rams are the high powered offense but they do score a lot of touchdowns they still do have it like you do have the chance of getting at least one point every time that the rams touch the ball which is why matt gay is good he's also one of the more accurate kickers in the NFL. Um, I don't know if he quite gets that, you know, respect out of a lot of people yet because he has kind of flown under the radar, but he's actually been a very solid kicker for the last two, three years, despite him changing some teams in the NFL. So solid option there. I don't really have much more to say about Matt Gay. Yeah. I'm just going to circle back real to real quick, just to, you know, one more thing on Evan McPherson because he wants um, to torture me. Because I want to torture you, but you know we we talked about kicker percentage. If you look it up, he only had an eighty four point eight kicker percentage last year. A little low in terms of around the league, uh, but that was some, a rookie. And you know, after that week five game against the Packers, where he was zero for two and the no one could hit a field goal game, he only missed two field goals the rest of the season. So mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about with accuracy. The so because he missed a few as he started getting used to the NFL, his percentage dropped, but he definitely came on strong. Uh, but back to Matt Gay, very similar in the sense, too, of like an offense that we expect to score points, very similar to a Tyler Bass. But Matt Stafford, I love Matt Stafford. I think I've always been a huge fan of his, but he does have, you know, sometimes he just overthrows a guy or makes one bad play that ends a drive and they have to kick a field goal. He's gotten a lot better. He has a lot more peace around him. I still think he's, you know, a top 12, 10 quarterback around in that range. Definitely worth the money big reason they won a super bowl um but matt gay is the kicker and he's doing well and again this is trying to find those teams that you want him to be on you know teams that are going to score a lot of points you're going to get a lot of those extra points are teams that might have a hiccup now and then but are still going to get past the 50 yard line and i don't think like you mentioned with the bills like they're probably going to cross 50 yard line on every drive the rams kind of feel that same way Exactly. So sometimes it's not always about finding the team that's good, but not great. But like the fact that they're going to get you basically in the field goal range every single drive means you're going to have some field goal somewhere, even if there's a lot of touchdowns. But uh, number five on our list is very interesting to me because it's a new look offense with the trade of Russell Wilson. That is Brandon McManus of the Denver Broncos. Cody has him at five. I'm at six. Brandon McManus is known for the monster leg. This man has been hitting long field goals his entire career and now here we are with him having the best offensive support of his entire career there's a good chance he could outscore that number five prediction um as long as that team's not scoring too many touchdowns and they're still giving him field goal attempts which i could see happening i think almost put that offense as the potential to be near where the bills and rams are but maybe a step down um but as long as this man doesn't have some kind of problem where he gets in his head and gets the yips or whatever he should be a very solid fantasy kicker this year for sure i think you might be a little overselling the the bengal or not the Bengals, <laughs> the broncos offense with you know how much consistency it's a lot of new pieces coming together at once it's probably gonna Fair. they're gonna have their moments but you know sometimes inconsistent isn't a bad thing and I i'm glad mcmanus hit it at number five because one thing also that you have to think about more with kickers than you do with any other position in fantasy football is location and weather. It's hard Great to point. kick in the cold. Mile high is so it's a mile high above sea. The air is thinner. Balls go farther. You get some of that big leg, you know, points. Cleveland, it's tough to kick in Cleveland in the winter. It's tough to kick in Green Bay in the winter. That's why even though some of these teams might have decent offenses, we're not high on their kickers because it's a lot harder environments. Dome kickers are always favored because they're kicking in a controlled environment 50% of their games or more. Uh, so weather is also a big factor. And because of that thin air balls, you know, a 50 yard field goal is a lot easier than a 45 yard field goal. And I, man, this show is riddled with technical difficulties <laughs> as my screen goes to bars, but 
definitely, you know, keep in mind weather as you're talking to it. But George, why don't you rattle through six through 10 while I try to get myself back up and on video for everybody else? Should I give a little lesson on color bars while we're going here? And Cody's trying if to you fix want, his go camera. Ahead. Uh, I'm not going to because I'm not going to take us back to our college days. We have video backgrounds if you guys did not know that. So we're having a good time here. But we're going to keep talking for you all. If you're all on audio, you can just ignore all this rant. And we're just going to keep talking about number six through ten. So we have Harrison Butker at number six, the Kansas City Chiefs. And then it's Ryan Suckup of the Buccaneers. Nick Folk, who we mentioned a little bit earlier, of the Patriots. Number nine is Dustin Hopkins of the L.A. Chargers. And number ten, Daniel Carlson of the Las Vegas Raiders. Cody, welcome back. Uh, at least Thank your you. face. Welcome back. Um, I'm actually going to start with talking about Dustin Hopkins a little bit because he was a guy who didn't even start on and on the Chargers roster to start last year. They finally found a kicker that seemed to be consistent for them. Um, and that offense is high powered. So I know I have him down at number 10, but if you're waiting till the last round to get a kicker, if you happen to not draft a kicker and he's still sitting on the waiver wire after your draft, I think he's one of the favorites of those like borderline number nine 10 kickers for me because you know there's always potential for him to get a ton of points as long as he stays consistent like he was in the air last year completely agree george and we've seen him you know be productive when he was in washington prior it's not like it's a young guy on a good team that we're have some question marks we've seen him be a consistent kicker in years past i'm just going to re-hit on nick folk we have him at eight but he is you know the top was the top scorer last year Uh, We're expecting a little bit of an uptick from that offense. Maybe that's why we dropped him a little bit, you know, kick and the high variance of him. But just to wrap up the top 15, we got Matt Prater for Arizona at 11. Will Lutz returning from injury with the New Orleans Saints. Jake Elliott with the Philadelphia Eagles. George's favorite Young Ho Koo with the Atlanta Falcons. And Greg Joseph with Minnesota, which I think might end up being a little low by the end of the season. Uh, But, you know, sometimes it's just hard to trust Minnesota kickers after Blair Walsh after they cut <laughs> Daniel Carlson and he went on to have a great, you know, a really good season last year with the Raiders. So they have a hard time evaluating talent, but you know, hopefully Greg J- Joseph can uh, be a part of that high powered offense we're expecting to, but George, anyone else on kickers you want to talk about whether it's in the 15 top 15 or not. Uh, the one person I want to hit is young way Koo because this man is still one of the most accurate kickers in the NFL. And you see how the offense affects the kick- kicker position The only reason he's down here at 14 in our consensus rankings is because we don't know what to expect out of Atlanta's offense. He's not going to miss field goals. He's not going to get you negatives, but I don't think he's going to have the opportunity. So if Atlanta's offense surprises us and does well in the first few weeks, hot waiver wire pickup, not that a kicker is that hot of a waiver wire pickup, but because the man's not going to miss. He's been so good for the last two years and has a monster contract for a kicker to prove it. Absolutely. I liked that. Uh, you know, pick two, you know, he's, he's the, you know, epitome of inconsistency. One week will have one point, one week will have three points and then boom, 12 points. And then it's back to one, three. So he's and it's gotta not get his lucky fault, just the offense, uh, get lucky that week. And then one other guy real quick before we move on to defenses, uh, the Dallas kicker, Jonathan Gary Bay, he's a rookie, uh, but you know, he could be this year's Evan McPherson, uh, because he's a rookie guy, not too much known coming out might have a little bit of a slow start, but you know, high powered offense that might have some inconsistencies that we talked about. Um, and if you're in dynasty and you have dynasty in your kickers and you want to lock one in long-term might not be a bad option. If you haven't done your rookie drafts quite yet, but George, why don't we jump in to defenses? Yes. And I think this position is a little bit easier to try to, I don't even want to say easier to predict, but try to control on a week to week basis than the kicker position is because the kicker position obviously is so based on the offense that per that team's on, if they're going to have a good week or not defenses, all you're basically looking at is number one. If you have a talented defense, they're most likely to be able to start in most weeks or you're playing matchups. So you're playing against how strong the opposing offense is. So obviously our first couple here on the list, we're going to talk one through five, breaking down individually. And then we're going to do the same as the other six through 10 grouped and 11 through 15 grouped. The one through five are the teams that we expect that you'll be able to start these defenses most weeks because they are talented enough that they're going to be able to pin down even some of the better offenses. And similar to kickers, number one is the Buffalo Bills. So we're taking Bills kickers and Bills defenses is what I'm hearing, Cody. It sounds like, and I believe Josh Allen was QB one. So a lot of high hopes coming out of Buffalo yeah. uh, this week or not just this week, this, this upcoming season. Um, but yeah, I think you mentioned it, you know, 
there's some things that we do in our league, uh, you know, to adapt to the the way the NFL is changing. Like we've reduced the penalty for the first touchdown given up. Like that used to be an automatically take off three points because in our league it's it's different across only, but a lot of teams and defenses they'll start with ten points, and then as the team allows more points, it will come down. Uh, we have reduced that allowing the first score because it's so rare that a a team gets a shutout or s- some points aren't scored. Um, so you might want to talk to your commissioner about doing that. But, you know, also things that are important to keep in mind is this is defenses and special teams units. So returns, like if a team has a really good returner, you know, we saw last year, you know, Chicago with Jakeem Grant, like that plays into it. a lot of t- Some people do return yards. We don't. We just do return touchdowns to help balance that out. Um, interceptions. I mean, the Cowboys were super high last year because of Trayvon Diggs and all those guys scoring opportunities. And then strength of schedule is something else you have to imagine. If you're playing in a weaker division, uh, you might not want them. You know, we think the Chargers defense might be really good. They're in our top five. I won't say exactly where, but they're in an extremely tough division. They're going to play the Chiefs twice. They're going to play the Raiders twice. They're going to play the Broncos twice. Like, so they're, they're going to be a team that you really have to believe in them. And the Buffalo Bills, they get to play the Jets, and they get to play the Patriots, which aren't offensive powerhouse, and they get to play the Dolphins, which look a lot better on paper this year. But those are three teams that have a lot of question marks going into this, into this season. Um, they have playmakers. They get Tredavious White back, which I think is going to be a big boost to them. We saw what his absence last year meant to them. And they're just overall a really good team, and I think that they're pretty easy, number one. That's why we both have them there. Yeah, I'll say my rankings in the top five to even ten, they can they normally either do one of two things right. They either don't give up a lot of points or they get a lot of sacks and turnovers because you either keep your ten points by not giving up points or you get points for every sack and turnover um, and defensive touchdown and all that. The Bills probably honestly do both well, which is why I have them at number one in my rankings. Um and I mean, there's definitely a chance that they're not as good as last year because you don't know. Like I said, these are high variance positions, but I think the slam dunk number one has to be the Bills. If you're going to reach out there and get a defense around early, the Bills are my slam dunk pick. And after that, I wouldn't touch anybody. But I still, again, don't even advise doing that. For sure. Um, and I think the next team who we I have is number two, George has at number three. And I'm actually, even though we're doing these, I'm going to loop them in because we're just flip-flopped uh san francisco at two tampa bay at three so they're pretty much tied for a second and i think these both tend to lean more towards turnovers but more importantly sacks you know 100 percent sacks they have defenses that can stop them down but we're looking at sacks when we're talking about these two teams they're consistently getting after the pass rusher they're you know the buccaneers are in a better division than the 49ers but the 49ers still have to get to play the Seahawks. They get to play the Cardinals, which you who's going to show up with that team. It's the first half, the second half Cardinals. Like that's a tough one uh, to pan out. So th- these guys are definitely more in the sacks and turnovers category, uh, but they're consistent at it. And that's why they're, you know, top three for us. Exactly. These two teams are very similar. So I'm glad you kind of did pair them together. Um, the Buccaneers especially can get sacks from any four of their players on their defensive line. The Buccane- the uh, 49ers really as well, but they have great pass rushers. They do a great job scheming defense. And I think the fact that both of them aren't in as tough a division um, really does help. Um, they really do do both things good like the Bills, but more sacks are great for them. And um, I don't I don't really have much more to say. I can move us on to number four. And it's actually number four for Cody and I. It's the Indianapolis Colts. And they do also, you know, get their share of turnovers and sacks. But I think the Colts just are known for having a fairly solid defense in general. Um, They have some tough times against some of their divisional rivals who they probably shouldn't. Like they always give a ton of points to the Texans for no reason, it seems, and the Jaguars. But they do a great job of limiting points, limiting damage. Um, And I think that's why they're up there because you might not get as many boom weeks out of them, but they're one of the more consistent defenses and have been one of the more consistent defenses in fantasy for the last three, four years. Exactly. This is all about consistency. They're always in this four to, you know, four to 10 range. And because we have some repeat years and, you know, defense is another high variance. Like it's very hard to say we don't normally see the top scoring defense repeat in fantasy football but the the Rams have been 
pretty consistent. They have one of the best linebackers in Darius Leonard. They have DeForest Buckner. They've added some other pieces. And they're also on a team that we expect to run the ball a lot too. This is one other thing you got to talk about is pace of play. You know, the Colts are going to want to run the ball and give their, their opposing team the least amount of opportunities as possible. They're not the Kansas City Chiefs that are going to score in four plays. They like to have possessions that go methodically down the field. That's the way they play. So it also limits the opportunity for their opponents, which means their defense has less opportunities to give up big plays, less opportunities to give up points. Um, so I think that's why that they're number four for us. And like George mentioned, just that model of consistency. And if you were paying attention and counting with us, you know I said the Chargers were in top five. We're at five. Haven't mentioned them yet. So the Chargers at five with the added pieces of Khalil Mack, J.C. Jackson, on paper, best defense in the league. Mm -hmm. well, that's on paper. Brandon Staley, defensive wizard. That's how he got the job so quickly. But that's, again, on paper. We have to see it coming into place. And again, I already hit on it, but their division is a gauntlet. And unfortunately, there are going to be some weeks where it is even as good as the players are, it's going to be a 38-35 shootout. It's just going to happen. That's why I have them down at number five. The only thing you got to hope for, and I mean, I think we'll have a better idea on how to handle the Chargers defense after we see a couple divisional matchups and a couple weeks go through. But uh, you got to hope that those like 38-35 games are similar to that um, best game of our lives Rams Chiefs Monday night game from a few years back like that game they scored a bazillion points they maxed out the point totals for both defenses and both defenses still had good fantasy weeks because they both scored touchdowns they both had multiple turnovers the ball was all over the place so like the Chargers added so many playmakers on their defense and like you said they're the best defense on paper that you got to hope even if they give up 35 points and end up at that negative four or whatever your league does for points scored that they're going to get five sacks, two turnovers, and maybe a touchdown. Because if that's the case, it doesn't matter how many points they give up. Um, but the fact that it is a lot of new players and new system, it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment. We might see some growing pains. They're just up here because of the ability that they have with those playmakers to get a ton of sacks and turnovers. Absolutely, George. And staying in Los Angeles, the Rams are number six. Now, they've lost some pieces. They lost Von Miller this past year, but they still have the best defensive player in football in Aaron Donald. They still have Jalen Ramsey, and they brought in Bobby Wagner, who's one of my favorite linebackers. So this team is very top-heavy with its you know star players. It does have some young pieces that have to step in, which I think is why we have them a little bit lower. But this is a team that could still put up points, still is in a good division, very similar to what we said about the 49ers. They play in that same division. So for me, the reason I have them a little bit lower, I have them at seven on my personal rankings, is just those young pieces that have to fill in for some big shoes. I mean, they still have they still have a lot of pieces, but there's some gaps in this team, I think. Whether they can bring it all together, we'll have to wait and see, but it, it will be very interesting. The Rams easily could be top, you know, at the top of the end because they have the the star talent to do it. Uh, but with some of the young pieces, I have them a little bit lower. Uh, but, you know, we're just talking defenses, and it's so, again, a lot more variance and a lot more can play out. And, honestly, it's one of the week-to-week, -week, you know, things. So that's why we always encourage streaming when possible. Don't try to lock yourself into to one defense. It gets tough if you, like, get into one of those teams that keep putting up, you know, 8 to 15 points a week. It's hard not to play them. Uh, but the Rams will probably be on most of the weeks, but if they're ever not on the waivers, like, it's going to be hard not to make them the your start of the week. Exactly. And I think a lot of these other defenses in our top 10 are going to be similar to that, but a lot of them are going to be more streaming options and good matchups. Number seven is the Denver Broncos. Number eight, we have the New England Patriots. Number nine, New Orleans Saints. And number 10, the Philadelphia Eagles. I want to highlight the Eagles slightly. Um, one, because I think that they have a chance to get a bazillion oh, sacks again. Our... But number two, no, their schedule is super easy. Like, I think I like them even more for the fact that their strength of schedule is so low than I do for the fact that they added a little bit to their secondary and can still get a bunch of sacks. Uh, that's understandable. Uh, my only pushback is I, I agree they can still get a ton of sacks. They've added the secondary pieces because they they can and they, they did and they're a really they could have be a really good defense. Um, 
only thing I would say is don't take strength of schedule as like when you're thinking of teams as a, you know, binary answer or anything. It's not good strength schedule means good defense because that's based on last year's record. All 32 teams have changed. It's not the same teams, but they do get to play the Giants. We don't expect to be very good. They do get to play the Washington Commanders who they have potential to be like a middling team. And then the Dallas Cowboys are the big team to compete with them in the the division. Um, But I do think you made some great points that they could be higher. And I think one team that always gets slept on is the New Orleans Saints um, Mm -hmm. because Sean Payton was always there with like, oh, that's an offensive mind. But the last couple of years, that has been a really strong and growing defense. And Sean Payton's no longer there. Yes, they did hire. um, And I think they hired their defensive coordinator, if I'm remembering correctly, to come in and Dennis Allen to come in and play head coach. So maybe we'll take a step back, but this could be another, it could be a more defensive, you know, fun team to our focus team to, to watch. So the saints are another sneaky team that you have to pay attention to. Just to add on that, like, I feel like they're the light version of the Indianapolis Colts, um, especially the last few years. Cause if you remember perfect example, Saints Falcons games for the longest time were like, oh, they're in the dome. They're going to put up 30 points a piece. And then like the last few years, there's been more and more of those matchups that, you know, end in like a 17, 13 game. Like they're always close, but they're the, the scores have been coming down. And I mean, now I guess their biggest matchup is Tampa Bay because Atlanta is kind of in a rebuild mode, but they always seem to have Tampa Bay's number and Tampa Bay, even those games aren't as high scoring as they used to be back when it was the Jameis Winston era there in Tampa Bay instead of in New Orleans. So they are bound to becoming the late version of the Colts. They're not the most amazing defense, but they're just going to not allow a ton of points and be more consistent. Definitely George. So let me hit through 11 through 15 real quick. Then we can hop out of here, but Baltimore Ravens at 11, Green Bay Packers at 12, Dallas Cowboys at 13, Cleveland Browns at 14, and the Kansas City Chiefs at 15. And this is why I think when you hear those names, this is why defense is so another position that's so hard to evaluate. Mm -hmm. The Baltimore Ravens, known for for their defense. It's hard to believe that we have them all the way down here at 11. The Green Bay Packers, not always known for their defense, but they put a lot of value into it. And if you think back to that miserable special teams performance at the divisional round of the playoffs against the 49ers, oh, that team stopped Kyle Shanahan, Debo Samuel, George Kittle, held them without scoring a touchdown. Plus, they added two first-rounders and get Jair Alexander back. That's a team that you can watch out for. The Dallas Cowboys, they finished second last year, and we have them all the way down at 13. Some of that is because they had so many interceptions, so many sacks with Micah Parsons so many defensive touchdowns too. defensive touchdowns we're expecting some regression like we said it's very hard for him to repeat but it, that's another team you have they get they kept Dan Quinn which we all thought he was leaving for you know a head coaching job that's another team the Cleveland Browns talk about sacks they have Miles Garrett and Jadavion Clowney it's they have Denzel Ward but that's the you know they have some other secondary pieces that were not so were other parts in the front seven but you know I'm just as excited as 11 through 14 as I am through six through 10. So defense is so hard to evaluate. They're all super close. It is very, you know, inconsistent. Just for example, like the Cowboys had a berserk amount of points last year at 182. Uh, But number two is the Patriots at 158. You go all the way down to the Tennessee Titans at 10. They're at 123. That's not even a 30 point difference in terms of how close two through 10 was last year. So just because we have them lower doesn't mean we don't think that they could be good for fantasy. Exactly. And the last thing I think I'm going to leave you with when we're talking about defenses is don't be afraid to buy into that um, streaming mentality, even in your draft. So you don't get the bills defense. You don't get one of those top five defenses that you think you're going to be able to rely on most weeks. It's okay. Maybe you just look at the week one schedule and say, oh, the Eagles play the Lions. I don't think the Lions offense is going to be too great to start the season. You go out and grab them for week one. Um, I got another. I had another example here. The Colts, I know they're a little bit of a higher defense. They play the Texans week one. You don't think the Texans are going to start off the season well? That's good. The Ravens play the Jets. We had the Ravens down at 11, but that's a great streaming defense for week one. So it's don't be afraid to look at the first week, two weeks of the season, see what defenses have good matchups that might not be the best and take a stab at it to start the season 
instead of drafting a defense who you're going to try to take the, the Hail Mary and try to start most weeks instead. Absolutely, George. And just the the devil's advocate of that side, if that's even how you pronounce it, but the Bills, we have number one. They play the Rams week one. Like, do yeah. you even are you going to take your, your defense in the last round, the second to last round, or even earlier where you might have to take the Bills and be like, I had to pick up a defense week one. Like, that's why George hit the nail on the head. Buy into the streaming, you know, idea of this. Start looking at matchups for week one. That's what draft the, the best matchup at the last in the last round of your draft. Call it a day. Look out for the next following weeks. If you happen to luck into one of those defenses that are consistently putting up points, stick with them. Like you don't have to cut them the next week, but you can because defenses are definitely streamable. But George, a show that we thought was going to be quick still ends up about an hour. I don't understand why we how we always get there. Every time we get on, it's like, hey, this one's going to be a short one, 20 minutes tops. And here we are. We just talked 30 minutes about defenses, 20 some minutes about <laughs> kickers, and probably 10 minutes about Madden rankings because that's what we're doing in the offseason. But football is almost back. Like I mentioned, training camps are getting ready to kick off. We're going to have real football to talk about soon. If you have any questions or you know anything like Tyler always says, even though he's not with us, you're talking fantasy football. It's more fun for us and more fun for you when you get involved. So get involved. Let us know how you're doing in your drafts. If you want your team graded, hey, we'll do that too. But as always, thanks for listening to the Couch GMs podcast. Yes, Cody. Thank you all one more time for listening in and uh, riding with us on this roller coaster of technical difficulties that we had today. But yes, for Cody Roadcap and George Kirk, thank you for listening and I'll talk to you next week.